Welcome to this virtual event, Perspectives from Women Negotiators, Negotiating for Peace. I'm Milan Verveer, the director of the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security. And I'm especially happy to be able to welcome three exceptional women peace negotiators from three different continents, all longtime friends of our Georgetown Institute. They have been there have been very few women peace negotiators. And yet we know from a growing body of research, those that have been engaged, that they make a positive difference. They bring critical issues to the peace table that must be addressed if peace is to be sustained after the agreement is reached. And they are more likely to cross divides to promote reconciliation and forge compromise. The peace negotiators who join us today are role models for women peace builders around the globe who are working on the ground tirelessly to resolve conflict and yet are not connected to formal peace processes, even though their experiences and their perspectives are invaluable and indeed essential. Our three negotiators are all awardees of our Institute's highest award for women who are advancing peace and security. They are all trailblazers. Today, they will share their firsthand experience as negotiators in peace processes in Northern Ireland, the Philippines, and Colombia. They provide us with important lessons that demonstrate why inclusive peace processes make a positive difference. Today's event also marks the 20th anniversary of the Security Council's resolution 1325 that links women's agency to peace and security. Clearly, we must do more to accelerate and support women's engagement in all areas of peace building, from peace negotiations to post-conflict recovery and reconstruction. If we truly want to resolve and end conflicts and advance peace, stability, and economic opportunity. Today, the Georgetown Institute is also launching a new report analyzing 352 peace agreements in 64 countries before 1990, between 1990 and 2019. The report finds that the share of gender provisions and peace agreements fell from its peak of 45% in 2013 to 29% in 2019. We know that women and men experience conflict and security differently and women's perspectives at the peace table are essential. Many women are working to advance peace and security agendas. They clearly need to be recognized and visible at the highest levels as well. Today, we are also excited to launch the second season of our podcast, Seeking Peace. And you can listen to it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or seekingpeacepodcast.com. It tells the stories of peace builders like those you will hear from today. And our latest episode features Colombian award-winning journalist, Jeanette Bedoya, who discusses her involvement in the Colombian peace process. I want to welcome almost 1,000 participants who are joining us today. We are thrilled to have each of you with us from wherever you are in the world. Before I turn to our conversation, a few housekeeping notes. This event will have simultaneous English Spanish language interpretation. At the, at the bottom of your screen, please click interpretation and select English or Spanish, whatever suits. We have already received many pre-submitted questions from our audience members, 
And as a reminder, you will also have the opportunity to submit questions throughout the discussion. Please submit your questions using the Q&A feature on your screen and note your name, organization, and to whom the question is directed. And now to our conversation. Dr. Monica McWilliams was the lead, a lead negotiator in the peace talks and a signatory to the Good Friday Peace Agreement in Northern Ireland. She was also co-founder of the Northern Ireland Women's Coalition, a political party creating, created by women civil society leaders. The agreement brought an end to three decades of conflict between the Unionists, who were mostly Ulster Protestants, and the Nationalists, who were mostly Irish Catholics. As a negotiator, Monica ensured that issues like prisoners and victims' rights, reconciliation, integration, and more were included in the final agreement. The work of peace does not end with an agreement. Today, Monica continues to be intensely engaged in reconciliation efforts and as a member of the Commission on the Disbandment of Paramilitary Organizations, and so much more. She's also an advocate for women's inclusion in peace processes and has worked with women peace builders around the world. Monica, it was so great. It is so great to have you with us today. You were one of two women engaged in peace in the first peace negotiations in Northern Ireland that led to the Good Friday Agreement. Tell us how you got involved, why did you get involved, uh, and what happened at the peace table? First of all, what obstacles did you confront in getting there, as well as what obstacles did you confront during the negotiations? So please give us a sense of what it was like and what it took to get there. Monica? I'm gonna to turn to Miriam and then hopefully we'll get um, Monica back uh, connected. M Miriam, Miriam Coronel was the chief negotiator of the Philippines government in the Mindanao peace talks and the first female negotiator in the world to be the signatory to a to sign, to, sign, to, sign, to sign a final peace accord with a rebel group. The comprehensive agreement on the Balsamoro with the Moro Islamic Liberation Front before joining the government peace panel, she co-led the civil society initiated drafting of the National Action Plan on Women, Peace and Security, which was formally adopted by the Philippine government in 2010. Today, she teaches at the University of the Philippines and is a member of the standby team of senior mediation advisors at the UN. So Miriam, Obviously, it's so good to see you again, and I know it's storming where you are, east, south of Manila. And it I is. Hope I hope <laughs> the winds are howling. I hope. Yeah, I home. hope so. All right, All right, let's see. Are so, you hearing me? Yes, we're hearing you. So are you I'm hearing me? Give, yeah, great. Yes. Yeah. I will yeah, give I, you this. So uh, this question, uh, if I might, how did you become the chief negotiator? in the talks with the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. And I know that- So you as far as, right? And in, in inclusive process, uh, you had women involved both formally and informally uh, on, bo on both sides in the peace negotiations. So can you tell us how that worked and how you put that team together? All right. Uh, well, um, I, got, I became the chair. I was already a member of the negotiating panel. But when the chair uh, was appointed to the Supreme Court, uh, the issue of who would replace the chair 
uh, rose, uh, arose, right? And I was like the senior member there, but in the beginning there were some concerns about having a woman chair a panel with a conservative uh, Islamic group. And, uh, but that was overcome and uh, that's how it happened. We, there was certainly an attempt to have uh, an inclusive panel. Uh, we had an Islamic scholar with us um, and then um, somebody from the non-Muslim indigenous community because they were, uh, I mean, they were the minorities, among the minorities in, in the place. And then we had people like me who had been involved in the peace process and also sort of like an academic scholar the way the previous chair was, uh, Law Dean uh, of uh, the same university where I teach. And the MILF also had an inclusive, supposedly had an inclusive panel in that they represented the different ethnic groups, but unfortunately they were all men. So uh, in the end, uh, when I came in, we increased more and more the number of women. We brought in one of the first feminist, uh, you know, founder of a women's organization in the region, in the, in, uh, it's, it's a Muslim feminist organization, and eventually also a lot more women in the technical working groups. So that's how it was. It was for me really trying to find the best persons and I knew women who were really, really very good. And I was working with the peace advisor who was also a woman, Teresita Quintos Deles, and we, we sort of, you know, uh, yeah, sort of for us, it was very important to really get more and more women involved. On the other side, of course, there was also that kind of a push for them to bring in women. And that became possible when we opened up the space for consultants and created other mechanisms like the technical working groups. And, and uh, Miriam, how did it work uh, back and forth between the official negotiators and civil society? Oh, well, we do have a vibrant civil society and uh, there are, uh, out, out of the 1325 uh, campaign, especially the creation, uh, once we passed the National Action Plan in 2010, when we restarted the negotiations, we just had the new National Action Plan and there was a lot of organizing around it. So eventually out of that process, even the crafting of the National Action Plan was a civil society led process. And I was part of that when I was still in civil society and not yet in government. And a network was created called the Women in Action, Engage in Action on 1325. And they were the uh, one of the many women networks that uh, really followed through the process. So they stayed on uh, all throughout, providing a lot of support. And I can say that I got a lot of moral support from them. Excellent. Monica, we're happy to have you back. Apologies, the engineer came in the back door and I didn't know and cut off the internet. Apologies. Oh dear. Well, I don't know if you heard the question, but let me repeat it. Uh, we just heard Miriam describe how she got uh, appointed to uh, the key role that she played in the peace process and the, the efforts she made to make it inclusive. I know that you were one of two women negotiators in Northern Ireland. It was not an easy process to get there. So perhaps you can tell us how it did happen that women got to the peace table in Northern Ireland and then what obstacles you confronted both in getting there and once you were there uh, actually negotiating. Thank you, Milan. Um, the situation in Northern Ireland was very different. I belonged for 20 years before the peace talk started, uh, many years to the civil society movements, to violence against women organizations um, and women's movement generally. And so when the peace talks were declared in 1996 after a ceasefire, it was through elections. Um, but there were going to be 10 parties. And because we had a pre-existing network of thousands of women and 500 women's organizations, we decided that perhaps we could be one of those elected parties. So in six weeks, we got organized. We called ourselves the Women's Coalition because we were Protestant and Catholic, Nationalist and Unionist, and some who didn't belong to either. So we were a coalition with diverse identities. 
And very quickly, we decided on three principles, which we took from the Beijing Women's Conference, which was human rights, inclusion and equality. And that was our manifesto. And we went in front of the people and we were elected six weeks later. So we joined the other nine parties, all men. And on the day I entered the talks, we were the only two women. We were outsiders who became insiders. We were ordinary women in extraordinary circumstances. And that's what happens to women. But the message really would be get prepared because you do not know when that moment will come. And when it comes, you need to move very quickly. And you need to have a good, strong support base in civil society and, and break down what you're going to work on into components and build a team and delegate because no one woman will do this alone. She needs to have a strong group of women who are experts in different areas and women need to have the confidence to know that they are experts. And that's when we came in then to broaden the agenda. Uh, and for two years, we negotiated. But we relied a great deal also on the technical support. We were politicians, we were elected, we were negotiators, but we also were facilitators and mediators. We decided to talk to everyone and that included the so-called terrorists. And that's when we started getting insulted and being told that you women are in love with murderers. Um, you women are naive. You women should not be talking to these dangerous men um, you women are going to be um, creating havoc for the rest of us um, by going into these places where no one else should be going. But that's what women do. And we built a safety net around us. Um, and in the end, we were commended for doing that, both inside the room and outside. I, I think also, Monica, one of the possibly not well known aspects is once the agreement was forged. It was the women who worked a day and night to get that referendum passed because it had to go to a referendum. Yes. Uh, we, the day we signed the agreement, we said it is easy to make an agreement. It is very hard to implement an agreement. So now we go to the people and we had about six weeks to go. And we, again, uh, we took buses and we took our children with us. We went into every town and every village. We knocked on thousands of doors. We translated the agreement from English into English uh, because these documents are technical and difficult for the local person to understand. Um, we took loudspeakers. We went to the public square, Milan. That's where the people are. Um, and we stood day after day explaining it and telling people and getting the message out into the press, into the television, um, because there were spoilers. And spoilers say no very easily, it's one word. Whereas if you're the person that has written the agreement, understands the agreement and wants the agreement to work, it's much more complicated. And expectations can be very high. If you're going to let prisoners out, people will call it a terrorist agreement. If they don't see the role of victims in it and the reparations in it, and we did not do as well as Colombia, they will feel failed. The politicians, as you've rightly pointed out, were only interested in getting power. And so they didn't bother to take to the streets like the women did. They stayed behind and got ready for the next election. And we were the ones out with our kitchen ladders up on lampposts, putting up all the uh, bunting and the messages to say yes. And I'm glad we did because we weren't so interested in getting elected ourselves. We actually did get elected again, but we were more interested in the country being at peace. Um, and again, we were commended for not being so selfish as to look for our own party interest, but for the country's interest. Thank you so much. And for all that practical advice as well. You mentioned Colombia uh, and you mentioned what went into their agreement. Uh, and now we travel there to meet with Elena Ambrosi. Elena was a member of the Colombian government's negotiating team in Havana, uh, where the talks were taking place to bring an end to the longest running civil war uh, in Colombia. And she was also the thematic director of the Office of the High Commissioner for Peace. For 50 years, the war between the FARC and other rebel groups, paramilitaries, and the government had taken a tremendous toll on the people in Colombia. 
and she was involved in the peace process from the beginning. Elena was one of three female witnesses among the 17 signatories to the framework agreement that was secretly negotiated between both sides in Cuba, where the talks were taking place and then signed in 2012. Then as an ad adjunct, a plenipotentiary negotiator, she was also one of eight women from the High Commissioner for Peace Office who played an influential role in the peace process from the government side. The final agreement was signed in August of 2016. And she later was named deputy attorney for the support of victims of the armed conflict uh, and demo, as, as she was named by the then attorney general. So Elena, uh, all eyes were on Colombia for a long time uh, during the peace process. Uh, and what you all came up with in the end is viewed as a model inclusive agreement that came out of a model inclusive process. What difference did it make to have women negotiators at the peace table? And how did you ensure that the range of issues that were central to women um, were maintained during the process? Um, and uh, obviously uh, during the um, ongoing implementation that is still taking place at a halting rate. Uh, uh, but, but how did that happen, that, that process? You even had a subcommission on gender in the peace process, which was unprecedented. Uh, so tell us a little bit about how this came to be. Bueno, muy buenos días, embajadora. Es un gusto volver a verla y es un placer y un honor compartir este panel con Mónica y con Miriam. Usted lo decía, se habla del proceso de paz colombiano y del acuerdo final firmado con las FARC como quizás uno de los acuerdos más incluyentes, de paz más incluyentes. Sin embargo, la inclusión del enfoque de género y la participación de las mujeres como, como negociadoras en ambas delegaciones fue, a mi juicio, un proceso gradual, progresivo y no exento de muchas dificultades. Cuando se inició la fase pública de las conversaciones en Oslo, en Noruega, la foto impactó a toda la comunidad internacional y a las organizaciones de mujeres colombianas porque no había una sola mujer entre los 10 negociadores principales, tanto de la guerrilla como del gobierno. Y de ahí empezó una gran presión de las organizaciones de mujeres por garantizar una mayor inclusión de mujeres negociadoras. Casi un año después, en octubre de 2013, tuvo lugar una gran cumbre que se llamó la Cumbre Nacional de Mujeres por la Paz, en donde participaron cerca de 500 mujeres de organizaciones de todo el territorio colombiano. Y ellas, al final de esta cumbre, exigieron, diría yo, al gobierno, por una parte, que se incluyeran más mu mujeres ne como negociadoras, y en segundo lugar, que en las conversaciones se tuvieran en cuenta las necesidades, los intereses, las afectaciones que el conflicto había tenido en las mujeres. Un mes después, el presidente nombró las primeras dos mujeres negociadoras y las FARC nombró una mujer negociadora. En paralelo, y usted lo estaba mencionando, embajadora, nosotros sentíamos que realmente no habíamos hecho un ejercicio serio de transversalizar el enfoque de género en los acuerdos que habíamos alcanzado. Y pensamos en la idea de crear la subcomisión de género. La subcomisión de género se creó más o menos en septiembre de 2014, trabajó por dos años, fue liderada por mujeres negociadoras de ambas partes y realmente hizo su trabajo sobre la base de miles de propuestas que enviaron las organizaciones de mujeres a la mesa de conversaciones, además de las propuestas que, se, que recibimos directamente de las mujeres víctimas que fueron a La Habana, de mujeres expertas en violencia sexual. Así es que yo creo que realmente, y a mi juicio, pues ese, el mayor impacto que tuvieron las mujeres negociadoras de ambas partes eh, fue justamente lograr un acuerdo incluyente. Yo creo que fuimos principalmente las mujeres, tanto del gobierno como las FARC, las encargadas de garantizar la transversalización del enfoque de género en el acuerdo de paz. Thank you. 
And it's, it's interesting to hear you uh, talk about how when the women gathered in a summit, they had been involved over decades trying to get peace in Colombia uh, and then came together and actually issued a set of particulars to ensure that victims' rights and, and other issues that were critical to the women were going to be on the formal peace agenda. And then as you described, an inclusive process uh, with the kind of leadership that uh, enabled it to, to be responsive uh, to all of those desires and to have women's participation uh, on all sides fully engaged. Um, so we'll come back to you in a little bit in terms of what's happening now, because I know everybody is uh, interested in, in um, where this peace agreement uh, is going in terms of implementation. But Monica, I want to come back to you um, now to ask, you know, you've always said for as long as I've known you um, that peace is never done. And I think it is important to keep in mind that an agreement is reached and pounded out. So many times uh, those agreements are abrogated in fairly short order. Uh, but what is happening now in Northern Ireland in terms of the full implementation? Uh, what still needs to be done to have the Good Friday Agreement uh, be fully implemented with all of those provisions? Uh, peace is holding. Uh, and there's also threats to the agreement. We're reading that Brexit uh, is rearing its... Uh, problematic head in this respect and potentially uh, could seriously uh, affect the Good Friday Agreement. So where are things today? Can't hear you. First, it's really important for enforcement because after everything, agreement is just words on paper. And if these proposals are not enforced and if there are not champions designated, to the enforcement, then people will lose hope and faith in a peace process. The first thing is to move quickly. When enemies sit down at a peace table and make an agreement and do a deal, shake hands and get up, move with that spirit. Make sure that everyone sells the agreement together because the first thing that will happen is that this new baby, the legs belong to someone, the arms belong to somebody else, and, and they all take the piece that they like and they start spoiling it. Well, there's enough spoilers out there against the agreement without the people who have signed the agreement destroying it. So move quickly, um, sit together where possible, sell it together. The people want to see you working on peace together. But get a validation committee. The women's in my party, the women's party, the women's coalition proposed an implementation committee. The men did not want that. They said, oh, we now have an agreement. We will uh, have good political will and we'll just get on with it. That did not happen. So the lesson is have a validation committee and if possible, have international people on that committee. Have champions from outside the country as well as those from inside. Task the different people with the different components and keep them to a timetable and make sure that they stick to it. We did it with prisoners. They came out after two years. It wasn't an amnesty. If they went back to violence, they went back to prison. Likewise, we did it with uh, the police, a massive, massive security sector reform of courts and police and criminal justice that became a model. And people began to talk about our police and the word was moved from police force to police service. And a service is a very different kind of institution than one that was predominantly military. And so people began to have faith that we really were making changes. There were things that were not done that should have been done. We did not address the victims in the way that we should have, even though we women, the Women's Coalition put the proposal into the agreement in the very last hour before the agreement was closed, we realized we needed to do something for the victims. 22 years later, we're still waiting on that something and that's not good. And we haven't dealt with the past. Uh, and, and people have pain and they have hurt and they have memories. And we need to deal with that sore because it's a running sore and it's still festering. 
and that destroys peace if you don't deal with it. The other thing is that the Bill of Rights, human rights are the core of police and the core of peace. And the police picked up the human rights, but the institution of government didn't pick up the human rights. And so my Bill of Rights, when I was Chief Commissioner, I drafted the advice, is still sitting there 22 years after an agreement. Only now are the parties sitting down together. So that brings me to circumstances. There will be circumstances that we did not anticipate. Like domestic violence, when a woman leaves a violent man, the first thing he says to her is, if I can't have you, no one else will. When the spoiler said, we don't like this agreement, we're gonna bomb you. And we're gonna kill those who negotiated it. And we're gonna put large bombs into cities to destroy people's faith in it. And that was the first thing that happened. And, and it almost wrecked us. But we got over that because we stuck together as peacemakers and said, we will not let these violent militant people take our lives. The next thing that happened was certain circumstances that we hadn't anticipated. There was allegations that people were not sticking to the nonviolent ways of resolving their differences through politics. And there was accusations of bad faith and people refused and said, you must hand over the weapons. Those who had the weapons saw it as a form of surrender. And that went on for years. As women, we said, we want all the weapons taken, but you cannot just make it a demand. You have to work for it. Again, a bit like domestic violence. It's also the attitudes as well as what people hold in their hands that needed to change. But the final thing is we did not anticipate leaving Europe. Europe was part of that agreement that I signed. I was a European. My identity, yes, was as an Irish person living in a part of Britain, but I was part of Europe. And it lifted me to see from a different balcony what could be done. Now we are leaving Europe and that's a disaster. Um, we may also be leaving the European Convention on Human Rights and yet we have no Bill of Rights in place. So there are circumstances that suddenly come that you cannot possibly anticipate and you need to go back to the table and you need to get your governments, the British and Irish in our case, and the parties to sit down again and say, how do we resolve this peacefully? For us, we're an island, an island with a border that no longer exists. If we leave Europe, it could possibly be that that border comes back. Now, so far that border has not come back um, but how do, does one part of an island stay inside Europe and another part of the island stay outside? So we have some really difficult constitutional issues to resolve and that drives people back. It doesn't drive people forward when they see these threats and one side perceives it as a threat that we could have a border again and the other side sees it as a threat that their British identity is being threatened because Irish people are saying they want to remain in Europe. So the message there is always try and anticipate anything that could, avoid it, avoid it. And the difficulty is there will be in the geopolitical circumstances of any country, there will be people outside the country who don't understand your country and they may make decisions. And that's when you go back to your champions, your international champions, you go back to them in our case with the US and people in the US Congress and it was also people in Europe. And luckily the European Parliament has stood up and said, this is not good for a peace agreement. But, you know, 22 years later, I'm working as hard today as I did the day I signed the agreement. So peace is never done and the agreement is never final. The implementation keeps going. So let's go to you, Miriam, and ask how has the agreement that you were able to forge held up? Uh, how has implementation gone? I know that you had issues with Parliament in terms of getting it uh, adopted because in your case, the Parliament had to assent to it as opposed to a, a national referendum. Mm -hmm. So where is all of that now? Well, uh, that's right. Uh, we were not able to pass the law during the term of the former president and that we signed in 2014, 2016, we had elections and you had a new Congress. They had to organize themselves. Um, so it took a long time. It took Aceh to come up with a new law in four months. It took us four years. 
well, the negotiations itself took a long time. It took 17 years to complete the whole negotiations. Um, but in any case, what we have now is a transition uh, government in the autonomous region called the Bangsamoro, uh, which, which in, by the name itself really acknowledges the identity and the, 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 that was at the core, the core of the, the struggle and provides them with a good set of um, uh, autonomous powers, both political and, and fiscal. So that is in place. Uh, you have a transition uh, assembly uh, made up of 80 people and 13 are women, a very small number, just about 16%. Uh, there are all appointees, appointees of the government and of the MLF. Uh, unfortunately, uh, government could have appointed more, but they only appointed eight and the MILF had to balance out all their commanders, all their other, you know, um, political supporters and had to balance out their slots. But in any case, I have to say those 13 women are very strong, effective women. They are also much younger than the, very, the rather senior commanders who have been fighting most of their lives. So they have actually been doing a lot of the work, especially, you know, the spade work, the writing work, and they have had their chair committees and they've managed to really see through very important uh, laws that have been passed by this uh, regional parliament, including the creation of a Bangsamoro Women's Commission, a Youth Commission, the Human Rights Commission, uh, and now they just passed the administrative code I'm waiting for the electoral code because that's very important. It's the, it will define how women will be able to locate themselves there when they are no longer appointed. You had six, only 13 and they're appointed and in an election uh, period, who knows how the politics will be played out. You will have traditional elites coming back and these are all, you know, most of them will be men. So unless you have something really good in the election code and the party list law that they will be passing, then you just might lose out again on women's leadership. But otherwise, uh, we have the ceasefire in place. This arm, unlike in Colombia, disarmament is also taking a long time here. I think we really take very, very slow steps. The MLF was very smart because they pushed for a graduated type of um, this, uh, you know, the commissioning of weapons and combatants process commensurate with the political agreement, with the political process. So it's happening now in phases. It's in phase two now, moving to, towards phase three. And phase four won't happen until, until the new government, a regularly elected government is supposedly in place and the regular police force in the region is in place. But we can see that kind of very good cooperation. I think Monica said that part, they had insisted on mechanisms to see through the implementation. Uh, the good part about our agreement is that we have very good implementing mechanisms and they have stayed there. The ceasefire mechanism is still there. There is still an international monitoring team that ensures compliance with the ceasefire and we, there has no, not been any serious um, uh, hostility taking place between the government and the MLF, and there's a lot of security cooperation uh, that's that have uh, that are very much uh, utilized, especially with you know we had incidents of uh, fighting now with the the violent extremist groups. One city was one the Islamic city, the only Islamic city, I mean, a Muslim dominated city in the country was. Um, was, part, was um, engaged in warfare against Islamic group. And to a certain extent, the MLF was able to support the safety of uh, civilians on that count. So on the security front, there's very good cooperation there. Um, uh, there, there are other mechanisms, the independent commissioning uh, body, which sees through the, uh, the, in, the implementation of the uh, the decommissioning of weapons and combatants, but to a certain extent, the other external parties like the Malaysian facilitator, the international contact group, they have sort of stepped back, but the panels continue to exist. And that was the whole idea. This was an, in fact, an MLF proposal that the panels stay there to troubleshoot problems in the implementation. If these are not resolved, 
at the level of the lower bodies or uh, then it goes back to the panel and so you have a mechanism uh, to do that but otherwise there are there are supposed to be regular mechanisms to slowly be put in place there are several intergovernmental relations body bodies that must be put in place to ensure that there's a very good coordination between the autonomous region and the central government of course it's taking a long time as well to really make that fully fully functional but yes the agreement has hold the implementation has gone on very very slow steps is in the tr transitional justice and reconciliation component that has been rather slow. Unfortunately, in, under the previous president, we, we had pushed to create the mechanism to implement the recommendations of the body that uh, drafted the, uh, the set of proposals on TJR, but that wasn't done. And right now also, there isn't a very clear mechanism yet exactly what body will be able to implement that. But, you know, TJR should happen between and among people. And you do have a lot of people's initiatives that are more or less trying to, you know, put in bits and pieces of the a whole slew of recommendations on how TJR should be done, coming from a very extensive listening process, coming from the people themselves on the and there are various suggestions on that. So you have a civil society flank that oversees, I mean, not oversee, but you know, that supports and accompanies and where there are gaps, they sort of try to, to fill that in. So I will say that it's still there and that's good. It's moving slowly, really baby steps. 2022 will be a cru crucial year and that's when the elections happen. The MILFs has said that even if they lose the election and they are actually also transforming themselves into a political party now, they will abide by um, the outcome. So let's see. In Nicaragua, the FML, uh, the Sandinistas lost the election shortly after, but they sort of got back and they stayed on actually too long, perhaps. Uh, but yeah, that's going to be the dynamics. Let the rule of law, let the regular institutions operate. Thank you for that uh, slow, but uh, at least encouraging. Uh, and now to you, Elena, we are reading about uh, some uh, setbacks that are taking place in Colombia since the agreement, uh, some return to violence. Uh, there is a discontent over the slow pace of the implementation in many quarters. How do you see the current situation uh, and what are you and others trying to do to uh, ensure that this model piece can not only take hold in a, in a sustainable way, but that some of the reforms uh, begin to take place? Bueno, embajadora, yo creo que nosotros hemos tenido avances importantes en la implementación del acuerdo, pero naturalmente creo que persisten desafíos enormes El plebiscito que perdimos dejó sin duda una sociedad muy dividida y la implementación del acuerdo se está dando en medio de una profunda, profunda polarización. No obstante, yo creo que es positivo que en la agenda de la implementación el enfoque de género ocupa un lugar importante. El gobierno y las FARC Eh, definieron una serie de indicadores para medir el avance en la implementación del enfoque de género. Son más de 50 indicadores que miden el avance en más de 100 disposiciones de género que tiene el acuerdo. Creo que adicionalmente hay una serie de mecanismos de implementación, lo mencionaba Miriam, que también trajo el acuerdo de paz colombiano, que son muy importantes. Tenemos una instancia de organizaciones de mujeres que debe hacer seguimiento a la implementación del enfoque de género y eso es positivo. Adicionalmente, la misión de verificación de Naciones Unidas tiene también un gran compromiso con el seguimiento a los al, al tema del enfoque de género en seguridad y en reincorporación y así muchas otras de las entidades que como la mía hacemos seguimiento a la implementación del acuerdo. Yo creo que hemos tenido avances en temas que son realmente muy importantes 
como la creación del sistema integral de verdad, justicia, reparación y garantías de no repetición, que a pesar de toda la oposición que ha tenido, viene funcionando. Tenemos conformado el Tribunal para la Paz y la Comisión de la Verdad. Es muy importante resaltar que el Tribunal para la Paz colombiano está compuesto en más de un 50% de mujeres. Realmente nunca en Colombia había habido una alta corte que tuviera paridad de género en su composición y creo que esto es además resultado de la implementación del acuerdo. La Comisión de la Verdad viene ejerciendo sus funciones, le queda un año más para terminar su mandato y yo creo que realmente es muy importante el trabajo que estas dos entidades han hecho además para visibilizar el impacto diferenciado que ha tenido el conflicto sobre las mujeres. Ha habido un gran compromiso de las organizaciones de mujeres con presentar informes a las entidades del sistema. Se han presentado más de 20 informes que dan cuenta de esos impactos diferenciados y de las violencias basadas en género que vivieron las mujeres durante el conflicto. Y yo creo que todo esto es positivo y nos muestra que realmente vamos en el camino. Hay obviamente puntos de la agenda que no han avanzado mucho, como el punto de participación política, la reforma rural integral tampoco ha tenido importantes avances. En temas de reincorporación creo que hay una política, hay una política además que tiene enfoque de género y creo que eso sin duda vale la pena destacar. Ahora, para concluir, yo creo que estamos enfrentando el mayor desafío para la implementación y es sin duda la situación de seguridad en Colombia. Desde la firma del Acuerdo de Paz hasta ahora, se han incrementado dramáticamente, dramáticamente, el asesinato de líderes y lideresas sociales, de defensores de derechos humanos, han incrementado las masacres, han incrementado los desplazamientos, los confinamientos, los accidentes por minas, el reclutamiento forzado. Nosotros creo que realmente como Estado fuimos incapaces de llegar a los territorios que estaban ocupando las FARC, de llegar como Estado, no solamente como fuerzas militares, sino llegar como Estado a esos territorios que estaban ocupando las FARC. Y esos territorios ahora son objeto de una disputa sangrienta entre organizaciones criminales que quieren controlar los negocios ilícitos como el narcotráfico o la minería ilegal. Yo simplemente diría que la implementación del proceso de paz colombiano se pensó como un proceso participativo, un proceso incluyente en la medida en que iba a contar con la participación de la gente en la implementación. Y por eso esas amenazas que se están viviendo en el territorio a los líderes y las lideresas son a mi juicio el mayor obstáculo para la construcción de paz hoy en Colombia. Thank you so much. And, you know, listening to the three of you, it is indeed uh clear that it does not end at the peace table. It only begins at the peace table and so much work goes on from the moment the agreement is forged. We're gonna turn now uh, to our audience questions and I'm gonna ask uh, Ali Smith to uh, begin us uh, in that process. Sure, we'll do a first round of questions here on the role of third parties. The first is from Edith Letterer, Chief Correspondent for the UN at the Associated Press. Her question is, what should the United Nations be doing that it isn't doing to ensure that many more women are part of peace negotiations? And a second question on the role of women mediators from Nicolina Nelson at the Swedish Minister Ministry for Foreign Affairs. A challenge we face is the recruitment of mediators. How can we be better at encouraging and demanding states to identify, nominate, and second women as mediators? Excellent questions. Who would like to uh, take on either what more the UN needs to be doing and what more can be done to get more women mediators? Uh, yeah. Okay, Miriam. Yeah, well, uh, about med the finding women mediators, I've been listening to uh, and discussing with some of the regional mediators uh, network of women, women's re regional network of mediators. And part of precisely what they, a lot of them have been saying is that, hey, we don't need more and more trainings. We need 
we need to do the job of actually mediating. And yeah, we need to get our hands dirty on the ground. Um, not just the, the usual thing of being able to do exchanges and et cetera. So that's the problem. I mean, there is no shortage of excellent women with capacity and expertise. And really, perhaps that's the best, uh, that's the first place to look at. Look at the roster of uh, uh, the women that are already networked into these uh, uh, regional women's networks. Um, and, uh, and you can even go beyond that. Ask other women. I'm sure they know other women who are certainly qualified and are uh, suitable for the job. So um, uh, that, that's what I think about that. Um, the UN certainly has, cert uh, has pushed this agenda very much. Uh, uh, one of the work that we're doing on the high, uh, coming up with high level, level strategies for UN political missions was precisely a call by uh, the UNSG. And I think that shows that uh, for WPS to really be advanced, your own uh, house is where you should start doing it. And that's precisely what we're seeing now under UN section. Uh, the, uh, our Secretary General, really a lot of appointees, a lot of UN political missions now are women. Uh, but as we know, th there are real obstacles, uh, the realities on the ground, the politics on the ground, this is where a lot of the problem happens. And um, you might also have cases where you have gender advisors, but are not effectively being utilized or are not in the center of things so that the agenda is not fully fleshed out, even, even though uh, there's there are a lot of potential still to be done. So I think, um, uh, and uh, uh, certainly we are trying to find more ways and means to be able to get down to the level of each political mission to really be able to have a more cohesive plan for advancing WPS. Anybody else want to tackle those two questions or one of them? Um, I'm happy. The UN were not involved. Um, remember, we were party to making sure that UN 1325 was eventually brought in in the year 2000 because of the experience of women at the peace table in Northern Ireland. That was fed into the Security Council and pleased to see that it had that resolution. As Miriam says, the resolution is only as good as how it is actually enforced and implemented. And so I find too often it's people talking about it rather than making it actually happen on the ground. You'll hear a lot of politicians saying, what a great idea, women, peace and security. A great idea, youth, peace and security. I always say, if you're going to be on the table, you should be around the table. So rather than having our issues discussed by men, the women should be there discussing the impact of the conflict on their lives because it, they have the experience, the grassroots experience, the gender-based violence experience, etc. But in terms of the question, mediators just don't come from the UN. They come from third party countries. And sometimes it's very difficult to find those countries who are trusted at a negotiating table. In our case, we drew on Canada, Finland and the United States. Others in Colombia, they drew on Norway. Miriam drew on Mal Malaysia. Um, and they have to act as an independent international third party. Those are crucial words, the word independent and sometimes the word international. Because sometimes you are so close in your own country to the conflict that you cannot stand up on the balcony and actually see the problems that are occurring inside the country and from both sides. So third parties are very important. They can also be champions. And this is where Hillary Clinton came in and yourself, Milan. We were taken seriously after you and Hillary stood up and started talking about the role of the women in our country at a time when no one was talking about the role of women in peacemaking. So finding those champions, wherever they come from, and making sure that they are part of your network, part of your data bank, part of your influencing um, in terms of getting the issue of um, women raised. And the other thing that third parties can do is insist on affirmative action. Now, not all countries believe, and certainly ours doesn't, 
in beliefs and quotas or in affirmative action, but others do. So draw on examples of where other countries have used it, have managed to get a percentage, either in their electoral system or in those commissions that Miriam spoke about. I am the only woman that's on a commission to monitor armed groups. It is really important that I was there because the men see it from a very different angle than I do. And that's what women bring. They bring a lens to what can we now do about these armed groups. Um, and I am, have managed to get resources for grassroots women leaders. And if I had not been there, those resources would not have gone to the grassroots women. So that's another important point about making sure that as Mandela said to us from South Africa, if you don't put a woman in that table, he said to the tribal leaders when they were negotiating their way out of the South African a problem, he said, I'm going to leave the chair empty. And it was a fantastic thing for him to say because he was so well respected and he did leave the chair empty until the tribal leaders then said, oh, we better put a woman in there. But it wasn't just a token woman, as Miriam said, and as, as um, Elisa will know, these women are experts and they bring that expertise. They're not coming with a photograph of themselves to the table. They're coming with a voice of experience. Um, and that's what third parties do, because I live in a patriarchy. I live in a very conservative patriarchy. And if the patriarchs had their way, they wouldn't have had any women around the table. But when it was insisted upon by US ambassadors, by ambassadors from other countries, from third parties and champions, the men had to say, oh, well, I don't really like that idea, but I guess I have to do it because you say so. So sometimes it just has to come from the outside. I wish, and over time it has changed, and there is now an acceptance because of UN 1325, but we have a lot of work still to do. And where these third parties can be influential, then use them. Thanks, Elena. Do a final round of questions. No, wait, here. Ali, uh, Elena's going to answer this round. Oh, apologies. Go ahead. Solo una cosa muy pequeña sobre el rol de Naciones Unidas. Sin duda hace falta mucho, pero yo quiero resaltar dos cosas que están pasando en Colombia que creo que han sido muy positivas. Por una parte, la misión política de Naciones Unidas en Colombia hoy en día realmente tiene un trabajo de género muy fuerte. Está integrada casi en un 48 por 49 por ciento por mujeres. Vienen haciendo además seguimiento a dos puntos muy sensibles del acuerdo, la reincorporación y la seguridad. Y en los reportes que han hecho el Consejo de Seguridad se han encargado de visibilizar esas brechas que viven las mujeres en materia de seguridad y en materia de reincorporación. Luego yo creo que realmente las misiones tienen una tarea muy importante en promover esa participación de las mujeres y en visibilizar esos impactos del conflicto en las mujeres. Y lo segundo que mencionaría es que Naciones Unidas opera un gran fondo de cooperación con recursos para la implementación y todos los proyectos que pasan por ese fondo deben tener un enfoque de género. Y creo que eso también ha sido muy importante porque no hay implementación de las medidas de enfoque de género sin recursos y creo que Naciones Unidas ha jugado un rol fundamental en garantizar que esos recursos de cooperación tengan en su implementación un enfoque de género. Gracias. Thank you. I'm going to go over time a little bit because we have so many good questions and this is just an extraordinary opportunity. So we'll we'll take one more round of questions from our audience. Great. So we have a number of questions seeking advice for women who are currently in their own peace processes around the world. Um, the first one is, as women negotiators, what strategy did you find most successful and what advice would you give to women peace negotiators in Afghanistan and specifically those currently in Doha as part of the government of Afghanistan's negotiating team? Another one here on the advice you would offer to women peace builders from Armenia, Nagorno-Karabakh and Azerbaijan today. So advice to peace, peace builders on the ground who aren't part of the formal process except in Doha, they are, there are four women at the table out of 21 on the government side. Who would like to go first? 
I'm happy to, to throw my top and forth in. Um, I think what you're doing and Georgetown and everywhere else is doing is keeping women's voices up there on the Taliban. It has to be no going back. If we have come this far, we have to maintain and sustain what we've won. Um, and it would be a disaster. So maintaining that and making sure that when the, those negotiations are happening, that people are shamed if they're talking about allowing the situation of women in Afghanistan to go backwards. They must be supported in every possible way. I, I did some training years ago with them um, and they are an amazing woman and their expertise needs to be at that table. Um, on Nargona Karabakh, I also know the situation and I wasn't surprised that this was starting to happen. And they had a frozen conflict and they had a concept of these wise men. They actually called them wise men. And for 10 years, they sat and chewed tobacco, I think, and didn't really get very far in trying to help resolve that. Now, what are the women going to do? They need to stay connected. And all I can say is, and I never try to give advice to another country, um, but it is good to find out what worked in other countries so that you can bring it into your own country. And we did that based on South Africa and Guatemala. But here's my advice is for women to try and reach out in the middle of a crisis to women on the other side. Um, because it's when in a crisis that you need to talk. And although they're hurt and although they're suffering and damaged terribly at the minute, they must know that there is someone that they can still speak to um, and to keep those communications going. I know that they did some of that through the internet um, and whether that's still possible. These are little small things, but small things make a huge difference. So it, it is to try and stay connected even at the worst of times. Um, and so, I mean, there's much more I can say, but I leave it there. It is true about the connections. Miriam, did you want to add to that? Uh, yes. Uh, well, yes, the networking co uh, connections among peace builders, certainly that's very, mm -hmm. very important. And um, at, the, at the local level, really, there is a lot of mediation that can be done. Let's not think that the, the mediation, negotiation, just happens at the formal table. Because the fighting is going there. You have the presence of uh, the armed groups, the different armed groups in these places. And the, the ones who are severely affected are precisely these people in the communities. So that kind of action uh, where you build the capacity for mediation uh, among local peace builders so that they can actually engage and help change the mindset of the warring parties slowly, slowly, gradually, because they need, these parties need the support on the ground. They cannot continue to exist if they do not have that support. So the, the strong messages should come precisely from uh, the peace builders on the ground, uh, have that kind of uh, courage, capacity, because this is also dangerous work that, uh, that uh, need to be done, and uh, push up, push up all this effort through networks that you can build together. And cross-cultural networks are certainly very important because uh, they give the message across that, especially in you know identity conflicts between different communities. I think we saw that in the Women's Coalition. The fact that they brought together the different uh, political religious groups in one women's coalition really was a very strong statement when especially when you had political parties that were largely based on the cleavage the that kind of a big divide between uh, the uh the unionists and the uh, you know uh, the republicans so we saw that also in the landmines campaign that we did before, where we had victims of landmines coming from different sides. And when women are the most, you know, uh, women certainly, a lot of women have been initiators of that kind of cross-cultural, uh, I'm not saying men are not doing this, but really that kind of impulse, uh, you sh uh, a lot of women have that kind of you know, framework to see how precisely we can be able to uh, reach that divide. For negotiators, it's very important, of course, to not 
be identified only as somebody who speaks up on women's issues. Certainly, you should speak up. But so should the men, right? You shouldn't be the only one speaking up. In our negotiation, it was very important to have a, an Islamic scholar, and he was male, because uh, he speaks up with some kind of authority. And if he's saying something that's pro-women's rights, then it certainly has unfortunately, much, much more impact than if we, we were the ones saying it again and again. So you do need that kind of you know, teamwork to be able to do that. Uh, make the men speak up in your team for women's rights and let them um, allow you to speak up as well on all the hardcore issues, security, economy, um, and, um, and the political, the power sharing and all of that, because certainly, the last thing you want to uh, to uh, for for a negotiator to happen is to sort of be blocked up and saying you're a single person issue. You only talk about this, and then they stop listening to you, and then they don't ask you, or you're not given the chance to speak up precisely on all the other issues that are all very important. And of course, all of these have gender implications. All of these have gender dimensions. And again. Uh, if that's not being laid out there, you sh certainly should do that. Uh, you know, that's a very good point, and it's actually a, a key issue in uh, Doha now at the Afghan talks, uh, that the women who are at the table are speaking meaningfully on all of the issues, uh, not just on, mm -hmm. on so-called women's issues, because uh, those issues permeate everything that's being considered. Uh, Elena, do you have any last words for us? No, simplemente y sobre este último punto que estaban diciendo, claro que creo que las mujeres tienen que elevar su voz y hablar sobre todos los temas y no solamente sobre los temas de género, pero también creo, y ese es el proceso de paz colombiano, que tener mujeres en la mesa es una oportunidad para incluir temas que de otra manera no serían incluidos. Luego yo sí creo y recomendaría a cualquier mujer negociadora que realmente establezca contacto con el movimiento de mujeres, que establezca contacto con las víctimas mujeres de su país, porque muchas veces, si no es por esas mujeres que están en el proceso, puede que esas voces no sean oídas ni tenidas en cuenta. Well, we've come to the end, unfortunately, and I apologize to our audience as well, because I know there were so many questions uh, but this has been such a rich, meaningful discussion. And I personally can't think of a better way to mark this 20th anniversary of 1325 and what it is to represent and still needs to be uh, than to be with Monica McWilliams, Miriam Cornell Farrar, and Elaine Ambrosi. Uh, the three of you have shown the way. Uh, you have led us on this journey in many, many significant ways. Um, on women's meaningful participation in peace processes. Uh, and today you showed us that it doesn't begin and end with the peace talks alone. There is so much work that needs to be done once that agreement is forged and all the ways that that inclusive process needs to continue. So thank you to each of you for what you've done and for what you continue to do. Uh, and thank you to everyone who is engaged on these serious issues um, ever onward and all the best. Thank you all so much.